All right, we are live on Las Vegas Triathlon Club Facebook page and we are recording. I'm John Mercer, president of the Las Vegas Tri Club and we got Ted Gerard, ambassador for Las Vegas Tri Club. Hey Ted, how's it going? Good, good. Yeah, it's Friday night. Uh, we're back at it again, talking triathlon. So, uh, you know, what could be better? And another weekend event to talk about. So, yeah, yeah. And, and we, we should give a quick summary. We, we debriefed on our bike time trial before we started this podcast. And that was a quick, we, we probably should have recorded that too, but yes. that was fun to just sort of talk about. That was a lot of fun. So thanks for putting that together. No, no problem. I was honestly just so excited to see everybody out there. Um, you know, people with their disc wheels and yep. their aero helmets. And it, it kind of felt like, I don't know, it's, it's been so long since I've done something that was truly like, like that. And I, and I, could, I do some virtual racing, but we we're actually out on the road and like you said, in the, as we finished off the talk, when you finish and you got spit coming down and slow <laughs> coming down at 6.30 in the morning, you know, you know it's, it's, it's an epic day. Yeah. So it was great. Uh, and I you know, saw the stories that people were posting, a broken pedal, yep. a tire. Yep. Man. It was a tough day. Yeah. You know, um, and I, I talked to some people that, you know, they hadn't been on their time trial bike, you know, in, in like weeks or months. Yeah. Um, or outside on their time trial bike. And I mean, that, that's great. I mean, we're, we, yeah. we, we were able to provide something. And, and for those people following along, and I know I put it in the Facebook page, we're going to do some more events. And uh, my goal is to do a, a one more uh, time trial for biking uh, every month. And then we're working on some running events as well. Yeah. So we, we're, we're trying to provide uh, a community. And that's what, you know, ultimately we're trying to build. And I hope that the, the Tri Club members appreciate that. Like we really, we want to create a community in Las Vegas and the Tri Club, or the, the triathlon community in Las Vegas, it, it could grow exponentially. Yep. As long as we keep working on these grassroots efforts. Yeah. No, that's true. And I think that was the other fun part about the time trial is not, not only were we racing hard or, you know, putting our head down, but it was with friends, you know, and that, that's sort of neat to see the stories and hear the stories and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's part of doing this is just having that community of like-minded people. Yeah. And so now we have a time trial this weekend as well. That's uh, right. It happens to be a swim time trial. In the water. In the water. And really it's a time trial. So some of the things we talked about last week actually have relevance here. Yep. And uh, no, I, I, and honestly, I'm super excited to do this. Uh, I, you know, I haven't done a swim race since my last triathlon last November. Yeah. You no. Know, mm -hmm. um, that, and that's a that's a long time to go, uh, at least for me and probably for you as well, without actually getting in the water and and, yeah. and going hard. Yeah. Right. I know we go hard in training. I don't don't yeah. get me wrong, but it's it's different. Different. Mm -hmm. When you're actually uh, you know putting yourself in that uncomfortable position of especially open water racing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So John, what are your uh, what are some uh, you know kind of I guess maybe I don't want to say tips but some strategies that we can talk about uh, that, that you think are important for open water swimming? Well, one strategy is always to know how the start is going to be managed. Yeah. So, you know, there, in the old days, and you still have some races that do a mass start, where everyone yep. just lines up, the gun goes off, and you all fight for position for that first buoy. And in those types of races, you really need to position yourself very carefully with your swim skill set and your swim fitness and you know if you're if you have any question about your swim fitness you really try to stay out of the fray uh, for uh, for that type of start and John, but, let's, add, let's add your swim confidence too oh yeah that's right if you could be fit but not be very confident and and confidence in open water with right. other people on you because i know high level swimmers that can't stand and nor are they comfortable swimming in open water with well, other it, people bumping them. Some even touches them. That's right. That's right. No, you know, very, very my, my wife, uh, she's going to come out and do the, do the swim. She was a collegiate swimmer yep. and she does not like open water swimming. Mm. And one of the things is if something touches her, she has a, it, it automatically triggers a fear. Yep. And she knows yep. like in Lake Mead, for example, there's nothing in the lake that's yep. going to hurt her. No, like, like I get it. We're swimming the ocean and it's like, yeah, you never know. Yep. Right. <clears throat> but in Lake Mead, there's literally nothing that can hurt yep. you. But the, it's, it's a, there, there is that nervousness that a lot of people have. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it doesn't mean good swimmer or bad swimmer because my wife is a way better swimmer than I am. Yep. But she, she, you know, she's nervous yep. in, in, in the open water. 
Mm -hmm. No, okay, for sure. So getting, so getting out of that fray is important. So let's talk yeah. about how you do that, John. I'm sorry. But how do how do we get out of that fray? Like if I'm if well, I'm nervous um, or a, one, if you're if you're in that type of, of event and you're and you're a good swimmer, you try to get to the front and uh, and get a position. But I always get a little frustrated when people say, "Do that first 200 really hard." That's not the way to do it. Now, it does depend on the distance, but if you're going to swim an iron distance 2.4 miles or 1.2 miles for a 17.3, even about 1.5K 1, 1 for an Olympic, doing that first 200, if you, if you blow it up, it's the same thing as the bike time, time trial. If you start off fast, you're going to pay the price the rest of the time. Let, let's it's give an analogy fun. here, John. So we've almost everyone here has done a 5K, right? So yep. 5K is about 20-ish, 20, 20, 30 minutes. Same yep. with the 1500 in a swim, right? Yep. Well, we've all been out and, and raced 5Ks where we have the little kids mm -hmm. that go yep. all in as hard as they can that first 200, 300, yep. right? What happens to them? Yeah. They, they die off. Yeah. And, and, and we wouldn't do that. Like if I got into a 5K, I wouldn't say, you know what? I'm going to go the first 20% of this as hard as I can. Mm-hmm. Because I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow up. Yep. And I think it's really poor advice that people get about the triathlon swim. Because it's like, oh, you got to get positioning. Mm -hmm. You got to get positioning for that first buoy. You know what? Mm -hmm. in, in pro level, yep. okay, yeah. Like if you're, if, or if you're trying to, to win your age group at a high, high level race, mm -hmm. maybe. But for the most part, I'd say for 99% of the time, it's, that's not important. What is important is being under control that's right. and, and not getting in that situation where you're like hypoxic and yep. yeah. So I, I think that's an important thing. So yeah, keep your anxiety yeah. level down. And so sometimes, uh, you know, I'll even, you know, I'll look at the crowd and I'll even position myself even in a position where I end up swimming a little bit longer but I'm away from the crowd that I have a feeling is going to try to just go out fast. Yeah. And so I'd rather take a little longer route and be away from them than be in, in the mix of this group that just tries to take off. And, uh, and no, just like you said, just like those kids at the Turkey trial, especially. Yeah. You know, they take off and then you're like, okay, well, we'll just pass them in a little bit. So yeah, we'll see you in a few minutes when you're walking. Now there's not a lot of races that do those mass starts anymore because partly because of the anxiety, uh, it, it, it is an issue and it's rather unsafe. Like if anyone does need uh, uh, assistance, it's hard for the kayakers to one, spot those people and then two, to get in and help that person. So that's something just keep in mind in our Las Vegas tri club swim. If you see anyone in distress, just stop. just stop. And all you need to do is sometimes just talk to them or maybe, you know, hold a hand out and just, lightly hold them up or, or, you know, or give a little bit of assistance, but you don't want to also get in trouble yourself. You know, if you're not a trained lifeguard, if you really don't, if you're not comfortable yourself, talk with them, get a kayaker's attention uh, to come over and, uh, and get some help. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's, that's imperative that we all take care of each other. Yeah. Um, and, and not just in this race, but in any race, if you notice yeah. a swimmer, it's kind of like if you saw somebody on the bike course that went over a guardrail mm -hmm. and you were behind them on the bike, would you stop and help them? I hope so. <laughs> I really, I really right. hope you would. You're like, oh right. man, I'm going to, oh, there's another guy I'm going to beat. Yeah. He, he's, right. he's toast. No, you got, you got to stop and you got to get, yeah. And you, you know, as much as we, we get into a mindset of racing, you do need to help your fellow athlete. So yeah, yeah I couldn't, could not agree more. Okay, so what are some ways that uh, somebody can kind of maintain, um, I guess, the, the, the presence of mind to not go too fast and start? Because I know I, I fall into this sometimes, John, is I'll actually get into a group that's swimming a little faster than I can actually swim, but I don't even yeah. recognize it for that first 100, 150. I'm just, I'm just seeing someone to my right, I'm seeing someone to my left, and I'm just going with them. So I think this is um, what I like to do in my regular swims is sometimes just start off as if it's a race, because unfortunately, we don't always have time to warm up before an event. And we get down, you know, we're standing in the queue to get in the water, because we're gonna we'll do a rolling start, we'll talk about that. Uh, but you're you're not really doing an active warm up, you're not doing a, you know, kick set, a pull set, and that, okay, now let's do the main set. It, it's not like that. And so I think in your regular swim practice, 
is get into a sense of, okay, I'm going to push off the wall from the beginning and I'm going to find my pace and then swim at 200 and check your pace and see if you're on the pace. And so I, you know, I, I really, you know, with swimming, we obviously have to really pay attention to perceived exertion yep. because we don't have a lot of feedback. Now there are some heads up display glasses out there, goggles, they're $200, but uh, they're, they are um, starting to become more common and you could wear a pair of heads up goggles, a heads up display that shows you your real time pace or pretty close to real time. And your heart rate. And your heart rate, that's right. And so, and maybe even soon power. Yep. So that's gonna be cool. Um, so, so, but so, it's, so you know, you could use a device like that, but most of us don't have that. So it's really just a matter of finding that perception. But like you said, now your perception is gonna be skewed by having other people around you, uh, the water, you know, swimming open water versus uh, pool. So how do you get better at that? You gotta, you got to practice the open water swims yep. and you know, do a lot of, um, you know, just going, you know, going down once a week during the summer and uh, once every other week and getting to a point where you can find that pace, you know, from perceived exertion. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. And, you know, especially for the people on, that live on my side of town. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a 45 minute drive on a good day each way. Yep to go to the lake. And so, I mean, I, I, I'm guilty as I don't go as much as I should, but when I go out of town, I always look for open water places to swim, mm -hmm. lakes, ocean, wherever. And, uh, which I, I kind of like because it's different places and then I get a different anxiety, Yep. you know, yep. Which, which is good, but it, but it is a challenge. You know, one of the things that I try and work on, um, when I am open water swimming is a rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a counting breathing rhythm. Yeah. And I, and if I can do that when I'm training, like if I'm, if I'm up at the lake and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do, uh, this kind of pace, like a, mm -hmm. a race pace for a uh, half Ironman, I will kind of start to get that rhythm in my head. I'll be like one, two, yep. three, breathe. One, like, and then if I go to the race and I do the same thing, hopefully I get the same, uh, kind of perceived exertion. I don't know if you do something like that. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I do you know, have a breathing pattern I use right in the beginning. And yep. then I go to uh, really breathing uh, every stroke, every side, yep. uh, you know, one side. And I even do a one, one every now and then where I breathe on the right side, I immediately breathe on the left. But in the beginning, I do usually do a, a breath every third stroke, just like what you, what you said. It's, a, it's to get into the rhythm. Also just making sure that I'm getting a good breathing pattern down you know, getting myself relaxed. And then, uh, then I get into breathing every, every stroke. And I'll switch the sides up depending on, you know, where we are in the water, which way the waves are, are breaking. But uh, then I, I'll, I'll breathe every right side for maybe 20 strokes. And then I'll breathe every left side for the next 20, something like that. So I think it's interesting. You, you mentioned that um, the rolling start and how that's becoming more popular. But I, I only see that happening in uh, like I am branded events. I don't see it happening in local races. Uh, U.S. Nationals isn't like that. Um, I really, I think that for most people, unless they're doing I am branded races, they're still going to be doing the mass start. No, you're right. Now, when we were in Copenhagen, uh, I had a register. I did the sprint race while Laura did the uh, Ironman Copenhagen, and they had a sprint race beforehand. Uh, actually, each day before the race, which was pretty cool. Uh, and I actually had to pick a start time. And so, you know, they started the first person, I think at like seven o'clock. And I think I signed up for like an 8.30 time. And I just had to show up at that 8.30 and I'd get in a short queue and then yeah. just start. So, and you, if you go to Europe, you might actually see, and that was a sprint race. Uh, there might actually be- um, The original social distancing. No, totally. <laughs> now we're, for our event, we will do a rolling start. So, and, and in large part because of the social distance, the physical distancing uh, aspect of this. So um, we'll, we'll start one person at a time and we'll just give some space and then uh, we'll just be a continuous flow of people at that point. We'll start the 3000 people first and then uh, we'll start the 1500. And then uh, in that time, the beginners will be meeting separate and then they'll do their own clinic and then they'll do a swim as well. Great. Well, I think, honestly, I think in, in, in this era, I think it's, it is, you know, the best way to do it. 
But I also think this could, you know, the COVID situation is going to kind of linger on and racing is going to move to this. You, you look in Europe at some of the racing they're doing and they have switched. They've been doing some of the racing in Canada even, and they're doing this exact thing where they're doing time trial based starts. Um, they just did a, a, a pro race in Canada that they did, I think it was one minute start, uh, one minute per start mm. for one athlete because they only had the, they just had professional athletes going mm -hmm. and men and 10 women. And it was like a time trial start for the swim. And uh, I think that we're going to see more and more of, uh, of this, at least for the next you know, year or two. No, that's right. And I, I'm, I'm responding to a post right now. Someone's trying to find out information about our swim. And I'm saying, well, we're live on Facebook right now. <laughs> that's so funny. So, uh, okay. So, but then the other way of starting is sort of a mix of the two. And that's a wave start. And that's the one that's most common right now. And depending on the race, I mean, you'll get anywhere from 20 people to, you know, maybe a larger race would have 50 to 60 people. So yeah. 50, 60 people is still a lot. I saw some of them, I mean, I've been in with 200, right? Yeah, yeah. Like in a wave, like, yeah. you, especially when you're in that 40 to 49 age group with the biggest yeah. age yeah. groups. Sometimes those are okay, like that's the whole age group's gonna go at this time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then obviously, I mean, historically, the Ironmans were mass starts. Yep. I think this year was the, f or last, the last Kona was the first time Kona even switched to a wave start. Yeah, or to an out of a wave start, right? Yeah. So, I mean, so knowing that and being prepared for that is, is obviously quite important. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people complain they like the mass start because they say they know where they are in the race. But in reality, it's so hard to know where you are unless you're really at the front end. Because once you start doing any type of multiple loop course, you're getting mixed in. And there's no indication for which loop anyone's on at most races. And so it's really hard to know where you are uh, at any time. And uh, now, you know. And, really, it, it, and it shouldn't matter. No, that's right. Like, I didn't know about you, John. Like, to me, it doesn't matter if I'm in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. I'm, I'm going as hard as I can You're go. You're doing what you can do. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm in eighth and I'm like, oh, man, if I really try hard in this next 5K of this run, I, maybe I can get to fifth. No, I'm trying as hard as I can. Yeah. Anyways, it's like I'm at my limit. It's not yeah. like, well, then I, if I go past my limit, well, if I go past my limit, I'm going to be not going to finish the race. Yeah, no, no, for sure. That's that you're doing what you can do. And it's not. Uh, once again, a pro athlete may be different, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. they're, 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 once again, we have to be very careful not to compare ourselves to a pro athlete. Because yeah. a pro athlete might be like, okay, I'm in 10th place. I might be able to get to eighth and get a paycheck. Yep, that's right. right. And I and if I go all in and maybe I could do it, but then they could also say, I'm in tenth, I probably can't get there. So I'm gonna turn it off because then yep. I can go race next weekend somewhere else. That's right. Right. And and but we're not making those we're not making those mm -hmm. decisions as age groupers. I mean, you know, we're gonna have three or four races a year, maybe that we really truly, you know, are going all in for. Mm -hmm. And you're all in. Yep. Yeah. So I agree with you. I don't think, it, I don't think it makes much difference. The only thing that happens that I think is, is interesting is you could finish your race and you look on your tracker like, Oh man, I'm in like third place. Awesome. I'm on the podium. And then 10 minutes later, you're like, Oh man, I'm in eighth yeah. place. <laughs> that is hard. I always, I always have to say, no, we got to wait about 30 minutes before we really figure out yeah. you know, what yeah. the positions are at that point. So, that happened to me um, in Santa Rosa several, I guess a few years ago. I was in second and I was so excited. I finished yeah. I was in second place. Yeah. And uh, I went off and we had lunch and whatever. And then I looked again, I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm in fifth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it just, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Like, because yeah. that's, uh, that's the way the start was. Uh, yeah, so right. you, gotta, you, you do have to be careful because someone could wait like 20, 30 minutes yep. and, um, and start at a different, a completely different time. So, mm -hmm. which I, I don't know, I, I, it, either, either way is fine with me, but just knowing is important. Okay, so let's talk about rolling start position. Yes. Because that, that, that's not going to play a big factor for our race uh, because we're, we're have, you know, probably 30, 40 people swimming at this point. Um, so it's not, not that big of a decision, but at a bigger race where you're doing a rolling start where they release four people at a time or yep. somewhere around there, it does matter where you, well, it, you, you have to think about where you want to start. 
you really have to be very, I think you have to be very cerebral about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not just for the swim, it also can matter for the bike. Like where mm -hmm. you start on the swim, yep. potentially can have an influence on the bike. So let's talk about your strategy you, you use, John. Well, I am, for an Ironman, I'm pretty consistent right around an hour for the swim. So I do try to position myself in that hour wave, but yeah. near the front of the hour wave. So uh, whatever they have uh, as the faster wave, they usually have maybe one wave before that. I'll, I'll be right, you know, right in that area at that point. And I like to be on the outside lane and I'll look at the buoys and I'll see where the first turn is. But I want to try to get in clear water as much as possible. I know people talk about drafting and there's a lot of benefit, but sometimes unless you know who the swimmers are that you're swimming with, sometimes you're, you're at a disadvantage because when you don't know their pace, you don't know how well they track and how well they swim straight. And so I try to really be careful, even in drafting, I try not to, uh, to try to purposely say, okay, I'm going to go draft right now and find someone. But if I find a swimmer who's swimming about my pace, then it has happened and uh, we're able to, to swim together. But, uh, but I'm the same with, with, the, with the drafting and uh, is I'll have swim beside somebody for let's say two yeah. or three minutes and mm -hmm. we're swimming at the exact same speed and yeah. I can see that they're going the same line I am. So I know that they're, they're, they're paying attention to where they're going yeah. and I'll purposely go behind them because I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I know I'm going the same speed with less energy. Yeah. I won't just be like, okay, there's someone goes by me. I'm going to get on their feet because they can be going the other way. And, and it's happened to me many times where they'll flip over and they sing on their back, they'll start breaststroking. And, yep. you know, so I, I agree with you on that. Okay, so do you try, you said you try and go the outside. So the outside of the, I think you can, maybe you can explain that. I, I think you're oh, trying the outside of the first buoy's turn. Yeah, so I always look for where the clear water is gonna be. Yep. And I wanna be careful not to get caught up in a group of people where all of a sudden you're fighting for position. Yep. So um, let's say the course goes out and it's gonna go clockwise in some fashion. I'll start on the left-hand side lane as much as possible, most of the time, yep. because I wanna stay on that outside part of the buoy and then make my way to the turn buoy uh, and, and sort of take a sort of a tangent. It's not that big, but um, and again, it, it may be a little bit longer at times, but I, I prefer being in the clear water rather than potentially bumping into people. You know, unfortunately, some people overseed themselves uh, because they're worried about getting out of the water. And so they, they'll get, and, and sometimes I get stuck in a later uh, queue simply because I had to go to the bathroom and now I try to get in the queue and you can't make your way up to the right wave or the right um, start uh, time. And so I've started late. And now you've just got, you, you know, you're fighting bodies or, or you're having to disrupt your stroke, looking to see where people are yeah. and then trying to find a lane uh, to get by them. And so that can be exhausting. So I'll, I'll much more prefer being on the outer part of the, uh, of the course and then make my way back in. So I go, uh, I'll, I almost exclusively breathe to the right. Okay. So I will purposely position myself on the left. Mm, okay. And I can see when I breathe, I can see people. Yep. Right? If I'm on the right and I breathe to the right, I, I, I don't see anyone. Mm -hmm. And I like to see other people um, to know where they are. And it actually kind of keeps me a little bit online as well. Cause I know if I get off the line too much, uh, the people are going to get further away from me mm -hmm. or I'm going to keep bumping into them. Yep. And I don't tend to bump into them cause I, I can see them. Um, as far as seating, I, I actually am one of those people that I actually oversee myself a little bit mm -hmm. um, because I know, I know I'm a poor swimmer in comparison to the field mm -hmm. or to, not to the field, to the people that I end up competing with in the, in sure. the track. Like right. they're close to me. And I feel that if, if I don't do it, then when it comes time to get on the bike, if a, if a group of my age group uh, ends up forming, with legal drafting yep. I, and I miss it, yep. um, I could be at a severe disadvantage. Well, and then you also have the congestion on the bike if you've got a lot of other people in front of you and you're trying to go much faster and yep. that becomes almost a dangerous situation. No, it's true. Like if, if, I, if I see myself, because I am a little bit more of a poor swimmer, yep. if, I, if I see myself too slow exactly, I'm going to be passing yep. too many people Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been races where it wasn't wave start or it was wave starts. And you've done the same thing 
where, and I'm, that's why I'm so glad they do this start the way they do now, where I've passed 1,500 people. Uh, yeah. Right? Your age group starts last. Mm -hmm. That's happened to me in a yeah. race with 2,000 people. Yeah. You could easily pass 1,500 people. That's not a safe thing to be mm -hmm. passing, 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 passing. Mm -hmm. And even if you're doing it, you know, you're, you're very conscious of it, it's still, there's, there, there's more issues. So if you can, if you can avoid that, um, that, that's good. And then the other thing for me is if I start a little bit, uh, a little bit overseeded, um, I tend to have a better chance of actually finding somebody's feet to swim mm -hmm. with because people are coming from behind. Yeah. Um, right. I can kind of gauge them. If they're slowly inching up on me, we stay together for, you know, yeah. for a long period of time. They're slow. Then I can get in behind that person. Yeah and actually draft off because ultimately you want to draft to somebody that's about two or three percent faster than you yep yeah so that's, but 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 i paid the price before too and just been run over uh, yeah i it, on some of those courses i can see that because they're they're set up that way there you can uh you you can be in the wrong position and that next wave is coming along and you hit that turn buoy too soon and all of a sudden it's just chaos corner yeah yeah, so let, let's talk about the turn buoys. So we 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 made it through the start. Um, the turn buoys are can be a menace. Yep. Um, and can and can cause a lot of stress, yep. and can cause injury, and can cause um, conflict. Yep. So how do you handle the turn buoys? So you've got to learn how to swim defensively. All right. So you and you and like you've already said, a lot of times people will get to a turn buoy. And even, even the first waves will do this. They'll do breaststroke or they'll do, you know, turn over and do backstroke. And all of a sudden things look a little bit different and, and the speed changes uh, quite a bit. And all of a sudden you're all congested and running into each other. No one's trying to hurt anyone on purpose. Well, I don't know. Not really. Not really. Yeah. No one's trying to hurt anybody. They, they, they might be trying to dunk you so they can... <laughs> uh, I don't know if Laura was on this podcast. I don't know if she's listening. Maybe she has a couple of stories, but <laughs> but no, but no, it, it's not on purpose. But it it just is. All of a sudden, you got this differential in swim speed. You're swimming fast to the turn buoy. The turn, everyone's going slower at the turn buoy, and so you've got this this chaos that happens. But you got to learn how to swim defensively, and it does depend on the clarity of the water. Uh, obviously, you know, swimming in Kona and the ocean, you know, can see everything. Swimming in Lake Mead is not bad usually, but the, it can get stirred up and it can, visibility can be a little lower, uh, you know, especially when you start getting a lot of people swimming. Um, with our buoy, it's out, it's going to be out far enough. So we're probably have pretty good clarity, but coming into the finish, probably not so much. Um, but, you know, when I swim, when I say swim defensively, I really keep my arms in this first third, especially at the buoy. So I'll put my arm in and I'm protecting my head and then I'm putting my other arm in and I'm protecting my head from any kick. And I'm, so I'm trying to keep my arms mostly up around my head to avoid um, some errant kick that I'm not seeing coming at me. And even, you know, if I come up on someone, I'll put my arm in, I'll push against their hip a little bit just to make sure that they know I'm there and that they're not gonna be kicking into me as well. And then uh, I know it, I, I don't really do this, but I, I, I also prescribe to people like get a little nervous on those turn buoys is just go a little wider. Totally. Yep. You know, the, the extra, once again, two yards mm -hmm. or three yards, yep. it's not going to make that much of a difference. And, and you think about the, most of us swim in the pool, like what's the difference of two or three yards? That's from like the, the you know, the, the T into the wall. Yeah. Right. So you went that much further yep. and you avoided all the chaos. Well, and you avoid the buoy too. You know, it, it yeah. sounds odd, but well, you know, yeah, the buoy is filled arm. with air. But yeah, yeah, you swing your arm over and you hit it. And it's like what? You're just not used to that type of, of interference with your stroke, and all of a sudden, it really throws you off. So. And the buoys move. People don't yeah. re realize that. You know, they're pinned down maybe 50 feet into the into the lake bottom, hmm. or the ocean, and the wind is blowing. You, we think that there's the buoy is stable. It's yeah. not. No. No. You know, unless they've got multiple cords, which nobody really uses, mm -hmm. maybe in like pro racing or high level racing, yeah. they do, but really the buoys move. And so yeah. you can be, you know, you can be spotting, spotting, spotting. I think I got it. And also the buoy moves a little bit and you're hitting it. And yep. it yeah. Well, speaking of buoys, 
<clears throat> I think it's important to make sure, you know, not only if you can see the buoy, great. You know, in our course, it's sometimes hard to see the buoy, so you really have to sight landscape, uh, which, is, which is good practice because you can't always see the buoy uh, during the race with waves and people and splash and what have you, but you got to be really careful about sighting kayaks. Mm -hmm. And I try to avoid swimming uh, relative to a kayak because kayaks are moving. Yeah. And you never know when they're moving. And so all of a sudden, you're, that kayak may move you know, 10 yards in one direction and you're sighting off that kayak and all of a sudden you're way off course. So the, the challenge, I always get frustrated when the kayaker is wearing the same color as the buoy in terms of a life jacket or something. Yeah, orange and orange or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that can be a little frustrating, but don't sight the kayakers because they, they are moving and that, that can really call, cause you to go off course. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So let's talk about sighting. Uh, we did this, I think on another talk we talked about, but let's reiterate it about sighting the landscape. Yeah. So yeah. how do we do that? You know, when I, when I uh, try to do a course recon or even before I'm starting, I'm trying to get as low as possible to the surface of the water because that's where my head's going to be when I'm sighting. And the, every, the visibility changes when you're down low and you've got to look and see where that buoy is and then look beyond it for some landmark, whether that's a mountain or a valley or, you know, depending on a course, maybe a building or a hotel. And, and you're really trying to sight, uh, you know, long distance, uh, trying to, to find that landmark to go towards and because you can't, you can't spot the buoy. But uh, I will do a lot of frequent sighting, but very small snippets. So it's a little snapshot, snapshot, snapshot. And then if I'm feeling like I'm off course, I will really pick my head up and I'll say, okay, I need to make sure I'm on track because that's one way to do have a faster over water swim is to swim the course as opposed yeah. to be swimming all over the place, trying to find, you know, a, ran, a buoy just by randomly, you know, going along. So I will, if I'm, if I feel like I'm not finding the buoy, even on my uh, snapshots or the landmark I'm looking for, I'll slow down, pick my head up, maybe even do breaststroke and then go. And that even on a turn buoy, you know, when you, when you turn, now everything's changed. You've got to find that new landmark to go for. And so, you know, get away from the buoy and then, you know, look and see where that next buoy is. Do be really intent on, on sighting on the turns and then uh, find that next landmark and go for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's a, that's really good. It's, it's, it's feel like sometimes you get caught up. I can't find the, the buoy on every, every time they look up, but if they'd just recognized that this hill was there or this building was there, mm -hmm. they could have used, uh, and it might not even, not even be perfect, right? But at least you're, you're, you're going the, the, close to the right direction until you can actually see the buoy mm -hmm. yeah especially like you know in races like the one we're talking about on sunday we don't have these huge massive you know 10 foot buoys mm -hmm. that, that some races have so yeah. let's talk about the buoys this weekend yeah so it's the you know the buoys that are out there are the you know no boat in loud uh buoys so just those uh white buoys that are about three foot high and you can see them great standing on the shore, but once you start <laughs> swimming, and if there's any wind and waves, it's really hard. And if there's any white caps, now it's gonna be really hard. Now, I am going to uh, take some, uh, some floaty, what are, the, what are the noodles? The, noodles. I, I picked up some noodles, and we're gonna try strapping them on uh, two of the outer buoys and uh, make it a little easier, but they're so thin, they're not gonna, then you're not going to be able to sight any better from a distance. Um, now, you know, this is almost done on purpose, but uh, it, it's sort of painful. We, we're starting at seven. I didn't check sunrise, but pretty close to that. And yeah. so sun's coming up right before that and usually comes up right over that mountain that you're swimming right into that first buoy. So what you do is you make one, make sure you've got the right goggles. You know, have some type of smoke goggles or, uh, something that's going to help block the sun a little bit. And then uh, before I start, I try to see where the sun is coming relative to the first buoy and then yep. swim to the sun. <laughs> True. I know it sounds odd, but that's what you're going to do. Now we'll also, I said, don't sight kayakers, but I'll tell the kayaker at that turn buoy to make sure that they're at that buoy. So it might help a little bit, but if that kayaker has to go off and help someone, uh, yep. don't depend on them. So 
but yeah, so then it will be, so for our swim course, we'll do our, we're going to go a little bit longer than our standard three buoys because the buoys are in a little bit closer right now. Like if you swim straight out to the first buoy, the middle buoy, that's about a hundred yards, maybe just a little bit longer. So if we just use the three buoys, that's about 500. I'm going to swim it tomorrow just to double check the distance, but we'll do sort of a four buoy course. So uh, usually we do three, uh, but we'll go to four and we'll go um, out uh, all the way to the left in uh, over one, two, three more buoys and then back in. So we'll do an inverted triangle and that will be uh, right around 700 yards. And so then uh, for the one and a half K, you're gonna do that uh, two times. So that will hopefully be right around 1500. Yep. And then each time you come in, cause this is the part that I, I don't, I didn't map out is you gotta run back up on shore. We do have the swim mat down, uh, cross the timing mat again, and then go back in. So, oh, so we had to stand up and run every time. Yep, that's right. And, oh, and this, I know hey, that's actually hard. And there are some races like that, you know, well, there's lots of races like that where you exit the water, uh, you check, you know, you run across a mat and then you're back in and swimming after running is not easy. I remember old splash and dashes here in Henderson and man, that's. Or even swimming. just the running after swimming, you, 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 you get uh, that orthostatic hypotension. Yep. That's like true. You get yep. a little, little, little syncope and a little, little feeling of, of, of fainting. Yep. Um, so the, let's talk really quickly about that. So make sure when you get, when you stand up, try not to stand up really quickly. That's right. Try and go a little bit slower there. Uh, trust me on that. You, you'll mm -hmm. feel a lot better. <laughs> you, you'll feel a lot better if you do yeah. that. No, that's, that's, that's great advice. And, and swim until your hand touches the bottom. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have a marker at the end of the mat that's in the water. So you'll be able to find it. That's that mat is actually pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to get another one. <laughs> I'm looking for, I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Oh yeah. No, you'll love it. It's just, it, it's uh it needs, it's 30 feet, but it needs to be another 30 feet on both ends. Okay. <laughs> so, it, but it does help quite a bit. Okay. Good. So yeah, swim until you touch and then stand up and then uh, you'll exit the water, go across the, the mat around the buoy and then uh, that's on shore and then back in for another one. So, so John, let's really, I, I hate to go back, but let's talk about the start again. So uh, just for people, you know, if they done, haven't done uh, a race like this, are they going to start out of the water or start kind of knee deep in the water? Where, so, the no, that's a good question. We'll start on the shore because I want to have them walk across the mat to trigger the start time. So once they cross the mat, their swim has started. Okay. Now we got the swim mat down, so it's a little easier to get in the water fast. And yep. that will take you to about knee deep water at that point. Okay. And maybe one or two more steps and then you're off and swimming. Okay. And so, you know, your time started. So, you know, you're not, you know, you're moving a little fast, but don't go crazy fast. Uh, because there are rocks. This is not the type of beach to do a running start. Yeah. So I would never do a running start uh, from the shore at this uh, at this location. So just we'll just an easy smart. jog start. A what? Easy jog start. Yeah, yeah, easy jog. But even then, you know, once you, because the water is going to be the dirt will be all be kicked up. You won't be able to see anything by the time you're in the water. Uh, you know, for for that first fifty yards. Uh, so you, and there's some pretty good boulders out there. So, uh, so I yeah. think all of us have hurt their feet at one point or another at Boulder beach. Yeah. We call it Boulder beach for a reason, right? That's right. That's right. So yeah, then, but get swimming as soon as you can and then, yeah. uh, you know, exit and go back in it the, the same way. So yeah, the swim start, we'll just have a line of people and we'll just be spacing them out uh, enough time so that we can, uh, hand write the time in just to make sure that we're, having a backup backup system to our timing system. Okay. Good. And, yeah. Uh, and bring your timing, um, bring yeah, your timing yeah. chip. And uh, what, and how's the finish work? Like when, when does the time actually stop? So you have to get out of the water and run across basically the same mat. Is that the final mat? Yeah. We're just going to have one mat there. So that okay. one mat will record every time you go across it. So it will record your start time and then it will uh, identify your, your last time that you cross it as well. Okay. And we can calculate your, your total time and we should be able to get lap times as well uh, this way. So well, that's nice. That's, that, yeah. that's really nice. Okay, good. Um, any other uh, tips? Goggles. 
Yes. So, all How right. many pair of goggles should we bring, John? Well, I always take two if I'm going to a race. I'll, I'll bring a couple more pairs just in case someone forgets something here. But in general, uh, if you were going to a race, you'd bring two, right? Because I always take two. two. Yeah. Uh, you, you just never know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you, you should have tested out your goggles beforehand yeah. and make sure that they fit. Uh, for a big race, I do use a new pair of goggles. Yep, uh, or, or I have my race goggles. And so uh, my big races, it, are, it is a new pair of goggles, but my, my other races, I'll just use my race goggles, if that, if that makes sense. So I'm the same way. Uh, and then. Uh, and I yeah. always bring one. Uh, we talked about this in that recon, but uh, I always bring a set for if it's really sunny. Yep. And a set if it's going to be maybe foggy or cloudy. Um, I think we've all, at least you, know, you and I have done enough races where, you, you know, early in the morning, you don't realize at six in the morning that it's actually going to be foggy. Yeah, that's right. That's oh, right. You did Mount Tremblant, right? Yep. Did you guys have fog in the morning? Oh, I'm sure we did. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was like, but. Um, we had fog so bad good. you couldn't see the first buoy. Oh, yeah. And everyone's like, okay, it's that way. And fortunately, when my wave started, it lifted. Yeah. And it was, no, seriously, because you could barely make out that first buoy. Yeah. It was so thick. And, you know, but if think about it, if you were wearing a really dark pair of gla goggles and that's all you had, because, you, you know, nobody was awake at six in the morning going up to that, right? No. So right. I suppose every morning was like that. Mm -hmm. but we were up till eight, so we never saw it. No. Right. And, um, you know, so fortunately for me, I always have two pairs. I have the sunny pair and I have the, the cloudy pair. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's important that you, you think like that. So let me ask you this. How many pairs of goggles did you go through before you found the pair that worked for you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, and now I have, <laughs> I have 20 pairs of the pair that worked oh. for me. Um, it took me, I'm going to guess eight. Pairs, nine okay, pairs, yeah, yeah. Until I found the ones, and, and and the funny thing is, is the ones that end up working for me. It only worked with me with the right nose, like you know, it was one of those ones you could change the nose. Yep. And I found one with a really narrow bridge nose that that happened to work for me. And then on Black Friday, they went two for one. Oh, nice. And I bought twenty pair. Yeah, like, right. You know, they're in the closet, and yeah. I, I I got yeah, I think I bought. 15 pair of the one color that I really like yep. and then 15 pair of, of, for, for, or five pair for really sunny. Yeah. Uh, Cause we mostly swim indoors. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I don't need the really sunny ones. And uh, yeah, I think I'm down to 12 pair. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was two years ago, but I was like, you never know they could quit making them. And it took right. me so long yeah. to get a pair that doesn't leak. It's yep. consistent. It fits my face. It's not like, you know, killing my will to live. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> that's right. You got to have comfortable goggles. I mean, it's it's like running. I mean, have comfortable goggles that work because yeah. it makes swimming so much more enjoyable. Yeah. And so many people are so frustrated. I honestly, I this is going to sound really weird, but when I was younger, uh, like younger, younger, like ten, mm -hmm. taking swim lessons, mm -hmm. I always hated swimming because I always had water in my eyes. Because I never found, I never had goggles that would fit. And I would yep. tighten them up and the, yep. the instructor would tighten them up. And next thing you know, they're just like, they're hurting you. And you're chlorine and you see rings afterwards. Yeah. And, and, and we just, yeah. and, and then honestly, you know, we did swimming in high school and this swimming here. And, and I just hated it. And I think honestly, some of the reason was I, I just, I had a pair of goggles. Like yep. you, you buy a pair, oh, that pair, it's, you know, it's $6. Okay. You know. And um, yeah, it's, you're right. It's a lot like running shoes. And so the advice I can give, and you should, you're we're trying to allude to, is it may take time yeah. for, the, for a swimmer to find the right pair, but it's out there. Mm -hmm. That's right. I don't think I've ever met somebody that really tried and went through a bunch of different ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, may cost, it may cost you a couple hundred bucks to get to the, to yeah. get to the right pair. And a lot of frustration, but you'll have a lot of good friends that you, you could be like, oh, right. what's a pair of goggles? <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. And uh, for people who have pre prescription glasses, they do make prescription goggles. And that does help. If you can't swim with contacts, obviously, then, uh, you know, look at the prescription goggles. It makes it more fun when you can see where you're going. 
Yeah. yeah and, sure. you know, I like the goggles for open water swim. I'll, let, I'll use a goggle with a little bigger lens because I like that field of view, you know, yeah. you know, seeing what's on, uh, you know, what swimmers are on my either side or uh, that's just a little bit more comfortable. But in a pool, when I'm swimming, I'll use a very narrow goggle uh, because you just have to follow that black line and find the next wall. So it's a little easier. I have not found an open water goggle that fits me. Oh, really? So like mine are the same ones I use in the pool. Like I've tried the bigger lens ones and they always leak. Mm. And I just cannot find that combination. I've, mm -hmm. I've tried. And so I've kind of given up on the thought of having that bigger uh, mm. vision and just, I, I, you know, you got to, it's got to be comfortable and you, and you got to not leak. That's the primary that's, thing. That, that's victory right there. So exactly. That's exactly. awesome. And then you've got to decide, and I know we talked about this before, but do you put your goggle strap outside the cap or inside the cap? Yeah. And you and I do it differently. So you go, you're outside the cap. Yep. Yeah. And it's weird for me, actually, it's really weird because being bald, I don't swim with a cap. Yeah. Other than a race. The only mm -hmm. time or, Actually, sorry. If I go open water swimming in the lake or the ocean, I put a cap on for safety. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I rarely do that. Yeah. And so when I swim in the pool, I don't wear a cap. Right. And so maybe it's more of like that feeling of the cap yeah. itself. Yeah. And yeah. So I, I, uh, I do, I, right now I'm not swimming with a cap in the pool because our pool water is a little bit warm. Yeah. Uh, but usually I'll swim with a cap for that very reason to, to make sure, because it, it does feel different. You know, and so it is good to make sure, you know, do you pull it over your ears? Do you, how do you, how do you, ha how's the water going to flow over that? And even how the water is going to flow over your goggles can be a little bit different. And so I do, I, it is good to practice. Now, I'll, I'll go with my strap under the cap, mostly because then uh, I don't need to adjust my, my uh, goggle strap tightness. When I go strap over the cap, then the uh, strap, because I usually wear it pretty loose it will start falling off the cap. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that irritates me. But the downside of that is I've got to wait to put my cap on because I, when I have that cap over the strap, then I can't really take the goggles and put them up. Oh, then it's all messed up. But yeah. you, you can put your cap on and you can yeah. hold on your goggles. And that's the other trick I think is keep your goggles dry and clean before you get to the start. Uh, and that will help your anti-fog uh, before you get too far so speaking of caps uh what's the situation for caps on sunday are we just telling people to bring their own cap yeah if you bring your own cap we'll have caps uh we'll have the Yelp las vegas tri club cap so if people yeah. need a cap they can certainly have one and if they don't but have one but if they have one that they like and then they use all the time perfectly fine yeah, yeah perfectly fine and uh to the mat that matter uh the swim buoy that uh people use that's perfectly fine to use too so that um, you know, you put that on, on your waist and then drag it behind you. We don't care if you bring a flo little flotation device like that. We, we kind of no. encourage it, right? For no, the... no the, we, we want to encourage people to be comfortable, uh, to be safe. And, uh, and that's what this is all about. Uh, yeah. and if that's what it takes, it's fine. Water's going to be warm. Um, I, I, I do not uh, think anyone uh, should be wearing a wetsuit. I've done a lot of core temp work on a uh, wetsuit and I'm finding in these distances, it's not going to matter too much, but still, uh, if you go to a race and the water temps are what we're going to have, they're going to say no wetsuit. So you want to get used to what's going to happen in, uh, in a race situation. Now, if you're really worried and you, you feel like you're be a little bit more comfortable in the wetsuit, certainly let us know and we'll talk with you and try to figure out what to do. And we have let people swim in the wetsuit just to make sure that they, they felt comfortable. And usually every time they get out, like, oh, I'm too hot now. So yeah, and then you know the other thing is, let's say somebody maybe not this year, but let's say we're doing an event like this, and someone was preparing for a race, and they have a new wetsuit and they want to wear it. Okay, because yeah. these are informal. But That's right. This is about the experience. That's right. Um, and we want you know we want to make the experience what's best for you mm -hmm. in, in these things. And if you want to wear uh, a wetsuit, you want to. That's, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see a problem with it. If you, as long as you know why you're doing it and we, you know, like you said, understand that it is going to be warm, yeah. but it's not going to put in a situation where you're going to get um, hypo, or hyperthermic. No, that's right. Not 1500. Not in these distances. And actually we've done core temperature uh, measurements swimming yeah. these distances and core temp is not budging much at all. Yeah. Now, I would also say that to, to your point, 
is that there are times where even an Ironman race, they'll say, okay, you can wear a wetsuit, you're just not eligible for uh, yeah. awards anymore. And that water temp is, I think you can wear it up to 83. So uh, just like you said, yeah, exactly. you know, if you if you think you would wear it in that type of water temp, this is the time to try it. That's actually and, a good point, right? Because it's yeah. like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it either way, and I want to know what it feels like. Yeah, no. for sure. But then then you may may actually change your mind afterwards, or you may say, no, this is fine, and now you know what it's like to swim in warmer water uh, yeah. in the wetsuit. Yeah, yeah. This is the, these races and the time trials. Everything we're doing is it's all about gaining experience. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's a that's an important thing to remember here. This is not the world championship. This is your mm -hmm. chance, you know, as an athlete to gain uh, gain valuable experience. So, no, and, and and you and I we talk about you know maturity of an athlete, and that maturity is you, you get there by having lots of different race experiences and and learning something each time. Yeah, John, let's uh, let's. I know we're coming up on an hour, but I wanted to just uh, ask you your opinion on uh swim skins because yeah. that is the thing that in in warm water that triathletes are wearing yeah do you advocate for those what is it what is it, what have you read on them what does the science say so the swim skins can help and it's um there's two things two ways that the swim skins can help one is they are uh, they allow the water to flow over the body uh quite uh, well and uh if people have gone and watched our power meter or our power cycling power podcast, uh, we talked about CD and the swim skin will reduce CD uh, for drag. So coefficient of drag. Uh, and you can even see that underwater. You can see how the air bubble bubbles are even moving over the swimsuit and they move over quite nicely. So that's one, one part, but the other part that we're, it seems to really be coming um, a little better understood is they provide compression and the compression seems to really help in swimming at least the data that we've looked at so far we even did some testing um, where I was able to go to Mallorca Spain that was fun where for another um, measurement we actually just put like on a, uh, a top like almost like a jaw bra type of, of, uh, of uh, uh, shirt and that had that was pretty tight because it was holding on an accelerometer that was measuring some acceleration while we were swimming. And that compression actually seemed to matter because we compared that swim with uh, not using uh, that, that shirt. And we actually swam faster in that. And so we started thinking that it has to do with the compression because, you know, we have layers of fat here, all of us do. And those layers of fat will start folding and sort of um, interfering with the flow of the water as we go along. And so uh, that's the other part that the swim skin will do, will we'll provide the compression. And, but you gotta know, they're, you get them on, they're, they're hard to get on because they're tight and they're supposed to be tight. Yeah, and that's the thing is, is I've been to a lot of races that are you know, not wetsuit legal. And I'm actually thinking of the race I did in Augusta last year. I'm standing there, it's a, not a wetsuit race and everyone's in these loose swim skins. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to like, I, I'm, I can barely breathe. Mine's so tight. Once I get in the water, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But like, it's like, it, it, you know, I want mine really, really snug. And yep. uh, yeah, they're all like loosey goosey. And I'm like, yeah. that is not going to help you. It's going to make it worse. Yeah. So that's yeah, another thing that's to right. remember. Like if you do use a swim skin, it's got to be, it's got to be tight. Anything you wear in the swim, loose is bad. Yeah. That's going to slow you down. Whether that's, uh, swim shorts or a tri shirt if you're going to swim in a tri shirt, but this is the time to try it. Yeah. And so if you have a swim skin and you you want to try it out, bring it and use it. There will be people with the swim skin on. No, I'll, think, I'll have a swim skin. Yeah. Or if you think that you would ever do a race with your tri kit on, yeah. try swimming in it and see, and maybe even do one loop with the tri top and one loop without the tri top and see how it compares. I mean, there, this is the time to try that stuff out. I'll tell you this, just anecdotally, um, my wife and I did a race, we did an aqua bike a couple of years ago and uh, we did it together and I wore a wetsuit mm -hmm. and she wore a tri, just a tri suit. Mm -hmm. And my wife is a way better swimmer than I am. She's a good swimmer. She's a good swimmer. This is the only time that we basically finished the exact same time. Wow. And wow. 
you and, and she told me she's like i could just feel the water yeah coming into my you know into my top because it uh, wasn't as tight it wasn't super tight yeah and and then i you know i'm in my wetsuit it's super tight so you have compression plus you have buoyancy yeah. and you know i can remember looking over at one point and we're almost like three quarters of the way through and it was olympic distance swim and, and i'm like marie is right there yeah right. he must be having a really bad day because <laughs> you know, it's never my day i know that yeah, right 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 and then so afterwards we talked and she's like yeah she's like i just I just kept feeling this like filling up yeah and uh, yeah you're right like this is a good chance like even though we're doing an open water swim if you normally are going to swim in, a, in your tri suit take it out there yeah, yeah. And, and see what it feels like and then maybe you know maybe you need a tighter one that's right or or Maybe you need a swim skin. And by the way, this year is a good year to buy swim skins. Oh, that's true. Because nobody's been racing. I've been seeing some unbelievable prices on swim skins. Lots of, lots of sales on swim skins. I'm, I'm seeing buy this and get a free swim skin. It's, uh, exactly. Well, or, yeah. or, you know, and we probably need to do this at some point. You need to know how to put your tri top on when you're wet. Yes. Because it's not as hard as um, it can. Well, it can be really hard. But there's some tricks to actually doing that. If you're so. not going to wear a swim skin, yeah, and people should know that like, with a swim yeah. skin in a triathlon, you wear your tri uh, top underneath your swim skin. That's right. That's right. Now, uh, is your swim skin short sleeve or long? Short sleeve. Okay. So you. So what do you do with your your? Do you use a one piece tri top or one piece tri suit or two? Two piece. So you still wear your tri shirt under. And it's so that's a sleeveless tri shirt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, yeah, you see that too. People wearing a swim skin with a sleeve tri, a yeah. sleeve uh, jersey, and if that's loose, yeah, that's what's going creating creating issues. If it's nice and snug, it's not a a, a, a big of a deal. Um, but there's not too many swim skins that are out there that are long sleeve. Yeah. Right. Right. You can, and, and then you just have to make sure the rules for whatever event allow you to uh, allow it. That's right. Oh, if I, uh, if I wear my swim skin and if I use a one piece, then I take the top of the one piece down and I'll fold it down inside, uh, the swim skin. Oh, okay. And then, then when I take the swim skin off, then I pull the top up. And, okay. Uh, Cause you wear, you, you wear one piece. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. If, yeah, uh, I should be wearing a two piece this year. Well, what am I saying? <laughs> Next year, <laughs> there's nothing happening this year. So. There's not there. There's very little happening this year. Uh, you know, as as you, uh, we actually should do a a, a, a like a week in triathlon recap as well. Yeah. Because um, what happened in triathlon this week was Indian Wells got canceled. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because I think that was the one that a lot of people were kind of holding out hope for. Mm -hmm. Um, Pumpkin Man and Las Vegas try. So, yep. Yep. So, I mean, things are not, things are not looking, uh, things are not looking very good. Um, Epic October is still open though. Epic October is way open. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're on the problem with Epic October and, and you and I have talked about this earlier is we may complete them in September, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. It's, yeah, that's it's right. Whatever it takes. Um, I think October is a, is a, a, a large window. <laughs> so. we're, we should call it Epic fall. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, we did a pretty good job of covering off the, uh, yeah. off the open water swim stuff. I, I, I enjoyed the conversation again tonight. So thank yeah. you very much. No, this is fun. No, good idea. And uh, always fun to talk with you about try stuff. So awesome. All right, Ted. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, John.